Ever since Link Summoning was introduced to the game, more and more cards that care about where they're placed at the field have come into the metagame. So in this video, we'll be going over some of the best cards that have column-based mechanics in the game. And coming in at number 10, we have Spriggan's Ship Exablower. This is a rank 8 monster with 1600 attack that you made with two or more level 8 monsters. It has the effect to target a zone on your opponent's side of the field, then it can detach any number of materials from itself to destroy this same number of cards in zones directly adjacent to the chosen zone. You can also banish yourself as a quick effect until the end of the turn during your opponent's main or battle phase. This kind of area of effect ability is not something you will see in any other card in the game. It all just makes it even bigger shame how close to being good this card is. It is unfortunately not a quick effect, which limits its usage heavily, even if it is actually non-targeting removal. Why you would go into this as your rank 8 to do with threats when Dengursu exists, which sends a card to the graveyard instead of destroying it, a much better kind of removal, and plays much better into interruptions due to being an on-summon effect. Despite technically having an effect during your opponent's turn as well, it's not ever an Xyz you'll make on turn 1, since you would need something that actually disrupts your opponent's plays, like Photon Lord or Hope Harbringer for monster spell negates. The Spriggan's archetype though, which this card comes from, does have an easy time cheating it out with Gold Golgonda, which is a pretty okay going second if you have a Spriggan to load it up with Xyz material. Despite not being meta themselves because of the lore surrounding the Fallen of Albaz, there have been a few Spriggan's related cards that have seen play, like Spriggan's Kit and Sprite Smashers. But even if this card isn't the strongest, it still beats out most of the other column related cards, which were made when Konami first came up with the concept, so it at least makes the 10th spot on this list. And with Albaz lore reaching its conclusion, we could still get a reason to run Exa Blower in the future. And at number 9, we have Scareclaw Reichhardt. This card can be special summoned to a zone directly adjacent to any other Scareclaw monster you control. When this card hits the field, you can add a Scareclaw spell or trap from your deck to your hand, and then if there are three or more defensive monsters on the field, you can also draw a card. The Scareclaw main deck of monsters all share the same summoning condition, but Reichhardt is the only one with an effect that actually gives you any card advantage. The Archetype's back row isn't actually the greatest, but at least you can grab an extender to go into their boss monster. Scareclaw Triheart forces all monsters in the field into defense position, which explains the deck's effects all have to do with there being monsters in defense position on the field, and is unaffected by the effects of monsters in defense position. Triheart is a pretty fine monster, being sort of a mix between Baguska and Infinite Track Fortress Megaclops. Unfortunately though, tower-style monsters are only really relevant when they have very few outs. Unlike something like the Arrival at Ignister, this card can die to lots of commonly played links and back row. This deck's impact on the meta so far has been because of the Link 1, Scareclaw Lightheart, as any Link 1 which fetches their field spell will be decent at worst. Lightheart does allow Scareclaws to get into the Link 3 pretty reliably, but it also has a pretty big boon for Tri-Brigade decks due to being the only Link 1 they can cheat out with their effects. Tri-Brigade is not as popular as it once was, but they're the one archetype to top with Scareclaw so far. Still, even if it's not meta, Reichhardt is still the strongest main deck monster of an archetype that could easily come into the forefront with just one or two new pieces of support. And because of Baguska, at least it can be used to go into the superior monsters which force other cards into defense position. And at number 8 we have the Weathery Snowy Canvas. This is a continuous spell which gives your The Weather monsters the ability to banish themselves as a quick effect to search another The Weather card from your deck to your hand, as long as they're in the card's column or an adjacent one, but it locks you out of searching for the rest of the turn except by drawing. The Weather Painters are a series of monsters which all gain unique quick effects based on which other back row is around them, giving you access to disruption or utility, like the card does by letting you search. The banishing cost doesn't matter, since all the Weathery monsters can special summon themselves from the banish zone anyways. This archetype did have a couple of things going for it, but ultimately their gameplay was just too slow for them to do much of anything. It didn't help that their best effect to deal with your opponent's board, the Weathery Thundery Canvas, was battle phase related. Still, at least it was pretty decent at duelings for a while, thanks to being more modern cards in a way slower format where the battle phase is much more relevant. The only person to ever manage a top of this deck in the TCG abused how all the weather monsters get the ability to attack themselves out to make cards like Torrential Tribute and Skill Drain completely one-sided versus your opponent. This archetype has received some pretty insane legacy support with the Weather Forecast, which uniquely allows you to use Spell and Traps as Link materials for their extra deck monsters. Still, the Snowy Canvas makes this list for being by far the best continuous spell of the archetype, as you can't get much better than a reusable Rota every turn, which also keeps your monsters safe from any kind of removal. And at number 7, we have Broken Line. A counter trap that can be flipped in response to a spell trap or card or monster effect is activated, and can negate the activation and destroy it, as long as that effect happened in this card's column. Despite sounding a bit underpowered at first, as it seems like it's just a solemn judgement that side graded that has a 1 in 5 chance of working, Broken Line has actually seen play a couple of times throughout the years. The thing is that, 
There aren't actually that many traps that have generic negates for anything like this in the game, despite the fact that every archetype seems to get an archetypal omni negate these days. When you want to go beyond Solemn and Dark Bribe, this is the kind of card you're stuck with. This card can be used to take advantage that, on a completely empty field, lots of people will just carelessly activate their cards in the middle of the field. The idea is to have this card in the center column and use it to protect your other back rows against your opponent's blowouts. The issue with Broken Line is very obvious though. It's pretty easy to play around it without having to change your plays at all, and it's the kind of card that will work maybe once per match, if at all. This is the kind of card where you can pop once every few years at best, because it's not even guaranteed to work when people don't know about it. It becomes literally impossible to resolve if people are. Broken Line does have two tops to its name, both a couple of years apart to give people time to forget about it, but it's unlikely to ever pop into relevancy again. There's just many better ways to protect your spells and traps which see play instead, such as Lord of the Heavenly Prison making it immune to destruction as a hand effect. But what really seals the deal nowadays, people will skirt around Broken Line without even thinking about it by playing around another card that's further on in this list. And at number 6 we have Iron Dragon Timaton. This is a level 4 Dark Dragon with 2000 attack. It cannot be normal summoned or set and must be special summoned from your hand while there are 3 or more cards in the same column on the field, and they can do so as a quick effect. Then, if it's special summoned, it blows up all other cards in its column and then locks both players out of placing cards into that column. Timaton was a decent tech in a couple of decks during Master Rule 4. Dragon decks have played as an add-off of Omni Dragon Brotar for interruption during your opponent's turn, since it has the most advantageous type and attribute a monster could have in Yu-Gi-Oh! Dark Dragon. Trap Tricks also had an easy time setting this up due to their archetypal Link 1, Trap Trick Sarah, and it also had the perfect level for Xyz plays. The reason why this card was much more useful during Master Rule 4 was because of how the zone blocking effect works. If you already had a card in your extra monster zone, putting Timaton directly below the other one would lock your opponent out of the extra deck entirely as long as you didn't give them arrows. Kind of like a discount extra link. This card was even more backbreaking against Pendulum decks though, since by just summoning this card on top of either Pendulum zone, you prevent the strongest play of their strategy. However, even with the utility of what's effectively an extra link, this card was still just a tad too awkward to set up to be more than a tech option in any deck that ran it. Even if you were way more likely to end up with three cards in the same zone due to needing to use your extra monster zone, it was still something that became really hard to set up once your opponent saw Timaton and began playing around it. With the Master Rule 4 revisions, this card gets even worse, since only decks that only Link Summon will be considerably hurt from it. But at least with the newly released Bisted monsters, there's going to be yet another meta-relevant dragon which could fetch it straight from the deck. So maybe it will become a consideration again soon. And coming to number 5, we have Magical Musketeer Caspar. This is a level 3 Light Fiend monster which allows you to activate Magical Musket spell traps directly from your hand, even during your opponent's turn. Then, if a spell trap card is activated in its column, you can add an archetypal spell or trap from your deck to your hand on a hard once per turn. The Magical Musketeers all share the effects of letting you activate Magical Musketeer cards during either player's turn, and some effects which let you plus when a spell trap card is activated in their column. Caspar just happens to have the best second effect out of all of them. Since there isn't any restriction as to what spell needs to be activated in its column for its effect to activate, something as simple as normal summoning Caspar and activating generic spell in its column will guarantee you an interruption in a follow-up, since this card will trigger again during your opponent's turn. Magical Musketeers might not have lived all the hype they had, but they were a pretty decent rogue archetype in their time. The biggest thing to look out for when playing around them is not absentmindedly activating your own spells in their column, since their effects trigger for either player spells and traps. This even gives the deck a small boost versus back row heavy strategies, since you can normal summon your monsters into the column with a set back row to discourage your opponent from activating them. Ties of the Brethren was pretty useful too, since it would flood your field with even more Magical Musketeers and turn 3 out of 5 columns into no-go zones for your opponent. Though that became much less attractive once Magical Musketeer Max came out, which could plus you even more depending on the situation. And coming in at number 4, we have Sprint the Iron Dash Dragon. A Dark Machine Fusion Monster which can be made with a Fallen of Albaz plus an Effect Monster Special Summon this turn. It has the effect to, during your main phase, move itself to another one of your main monster zones. Then it destroys all of the cards in that column. It also has a graveyard effect, where if this card is sent there this turn, you get to add or special summon a Spriggan's monster or a Fallen of Albaz during the end phase. Sprint was a somewhat popular tech in branded Despia decks, for a couple of reasons which have nothing to do with its on-field effect. The end phase floating effect was easily set up with Mirror Jade the Ice Blade Dragon, since it can send Sprint to the graveyard as a cost to activate its effect to banish a card on the field. While the main Spriggan monsters don't do anything for a Despia strategy, you can still bring out Fallen of Albaz to fuse away your opponent's monsters as the turn ends, or Spriggan's Kit, since its effect fetches you a branded spell from your deck, graveyard, or banish zone. This can actually be slightly better than sending an Albion in some situations. The other reason is that this card is the only way for branded decks to play around Contact C. 
This hand trap can special summon itself to your opponent's field when they summon a monster, and it locks them out of the extra deck fusions unless they use Contact C as a material. After activating Branded Fusion, the Branded decks will still have to go through another fusion to get into their main boss monster, so you can just drop Contact C at this point to make the effect fizzle. Unless, of course, they run Sprint in their extra deck, which still won't let them go into their boss monster, but at least it'll get rid of the extra deck lock it applies while up. And at number 3, we have Mech Knight Purple Nightfall. A level 8 light psychic monster with 2500 attack, it can special summon itself to a column with 2 or more cards in it already, and it can only be special summoned once per turn this way. Its effect is that you can target a Mech Knight monster you control, including itself, and banish it until the end phase, and then you get to add a Mech Knight monster from your deck to your hand, except another copy of itself. When it comes to dealing with columns, the Mech Knights are probably one of the first things that come to mind for the average Yu-Gi-Oh player. All of them pack huge bodies in the same summoning condition, and all saw play in multiple decks ever since they came out. Purple Nightfall is the one that makes this list due to being by far the best out of all of them. But if I didn't limit this list to just having a single one of the big Mech Knights, half of this top 10 could be filled with them. The archetype has tons of consistency going on for it, even outside of purple, with the blue sky being able to possibly add three different cards from your deck to your hand at once, and even an archetypal emergency teleport with World Legacy's memory. They were usually played alongside an invoked engine because the archetype didn't really need its normal summon. Alistair lets you set up your columns even while your opponent has nothing, since you can link it off for a link 1, and then set the invocation you search to turn on your mech engine. After doing your mech knight plays, you can then go into invoked Makaba with the set invocation, whose negate can be an extreme pain to deal with if you get to a simplified game state. Mechs were played mainly as a going second strategy, together with tons of removal options like kaijus and evenly matched. For lots of formats, it was extremely common to see people avoiding putting two cards in the same column while building their board, just to play around mech knights. And coming in at number 2, we have Gursu the Orcus Mech Knight. This is a level 4 dark machine monster, and it's uniquely part of both the Mech Knight and Orcus archetypes. When it's summoned, it has the effect to send any Orcus or World Legacy card from your deck to your graveyard, and then if there are two more cards in this column, it becomes a tuner. Also, if you control no other monsters, you can special summon a level 1 dark machine token with no stats to both sides of the field. Now, while I did say I would only go over a single one of the main Mech Knight monsters, Gursu itself still does deserve a spot due to being a later addition to the archetype, which was more useful as an Orcus starter than anything else. This card sets up the archetype's entire combo by itself, being a foolish burial for some of the most busted graveyard effects in the game, which can give you an extra link material on the field. If this card had come out while Orcus Harpoor was still legal in the TCG, it had been one of the most powerful one-card enablers in the game. They do have both of them legal in the OCG, but that's only because they chose to put Gursu to 1 to limit its consistency instead, as well as Galatea the Orcus Automaton, which cuts the deck's grind game and makes the combo worse. Sometimes this card even replaces Alistair as the Mech Knight's normal summon of choice. While the on-summon effect is much less impactful than in Orcus decks, it gives it the option to search a normal summon with many cards from your Mech Knight engine instead of having to draw into the Alistair one. The token spawning effect also serves to both go into Mech Knight of the Morning Star as well as easily put two cards at the same column. While Gursu's actual column-related effects rarely comes up, it still makes it this high on this list due to being one of the strongest pieces of support ever released, being a starter for both Mechs and Orcus. And coming in at number 1, we have Infinite Impermanence. A normal trap which targets a face-up monster in the field and negates its effects until the end of the turn. It can also be activated from your hand as long as you control no cards on the field, but if you activate it while it is set, it also negates any spell and trap card effects in the column it was set in for the rest of the turn. Infinite Impermanence is one of the strongest staples we have available in Yu-Gi-Oh! Being a card that's seen tons of play ever since it came out with pretty much no interruption. It is one of the best hand traps we have access to right now, and any deck which is playing defensive cards is likely to have a play set of Imperm at 3. Imperm power crept effect Veiler pretty hard, since it can be activated during any phase and outside of your opponent's turn. It also only got better with time, as it plays around Triple Tactics Talent since it's not an effect monster, and combo decks are more likely to make monster negates than spell and trap card negates to protect their combos. It's also a pretty decent card to draw as your 6th one when going 2nd, since you can still use it to get rid of an annoying monster's effect your opponent has before you start playing. Its effect when set does get outshined by its hand trap effect, but it's still a pretty relevant part about why this card is so good. One of the reasons why a previous card on this list, Broken Line, is so weak these days is because most people will instinctively not activate spells and traps in the same column as your spells and traps to play around a set imperm. You can catch your opponent off guard and give you a free negate for a spell or trap but they forget that a set imperm was activated that turn, but that's more of a bonus than anything. Usually what will happen is that in a slower game state, when you've been floodgated and can't play, you will set imperm in the same column as that floodgate to turn it off for a turn and try to destroy it or kill your opponent. In the modern metagame, when people do pay attention to the columns, it's usually because of infinite impermanence. You won't ever see your opponent setting a spell in the same column as yours unless they're either setting an imperm or wanting to bluff that they have it. 
Infinite Impermanence is an extremely versatile staple, which will continue to see play unless the game changes dramatically. And for this, it easily takes the first spot on this list. Also, just a quick little aside, we have a Pokemon TCG channel now. So if you like the videos on this channel, well, that channel is basically that, just with the Pokemon TCG. We have a video going over some of the earliest Pokemon cards, so if you like that, you should check it out in the video description or at the end of this video right now.